Hello and welcome to Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack. This time it's a return to the occasional series of looking at previous Liberal Democrat leaders with Lib Dem History Group founder, Duncan Brack. Welcome back, Duncan. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be back. Now, having rummaged deeper into the party's past in previous episodes with you, this time we're going to look be a little bit more recent and have a look at Charles Kennedy's tenure. Now, some listeners will, I'm sure, be very familiar with Charles's time as an MP and then leader. But for newer listeners, do you want to give a quick sort of two paragraph summary of his life before we plunge into the details? Yes. So Charles Kennedy was uh, elected to Parliament in 1983 at the age of, I think, 23. He was the youngest MP in the House of Commons. He was the only gain for the Social Democratic Party in that election and quite against the odds. So it was quite a surprise. Kind of seen as a rising star of the SDP. He was the only SDP MP to then support merger with the Liberal Party in 1987, 88, and then seen as a kind of rising star of the Liberal Democrats, eventually became the second leader of the Liberal Democrats in 1999 following Paddy Ashdown, and stayed as leader until 2006, when he was removed essentially by growing unhappiness amongst the parliamentary party, at a mixture of his alcoholism, which had been sort of suspected but steadily denied until around about the end of 2005, and also a general feeling that he wasn't actually giving the party a clear lead. Um, so then he resigned eventually in January 06, held a seat until 2015 when he lost it amongst the, the general rout of the party's MPs in the wake of the coalition, lost it to the SNP. And then very sadly, a month later, was found dead in his home, basically of kind of stresses incurred on his body by long-term alcoholism. He's kind of seen, I think nowadays, almost as, it, he almost has sort of sainthood status in many parts of the party. I was just looking back at tweets from our Liberal Democrat history group what on this day series of tweets and on december the 18th 2023 we reminded people that on this day in 2007 nick clegg was elected leader of the liberal democrats and one response was worst ever leader not a patch on the late charlie kennedy um my own personal view is that he was a remarkable politician a unique politician in many ways and is very much missed but that i don't think he was a good leader or anywhere near the best leader of the parties ever had but this so is undoubtedly we get, what we're going to explain. Exactly. Which before is. we get into the controversial territory, I think it's in, I'd quite like to start actually with his election in 1983, because as someone who's very much a political campaigner, I always find it slightly odd that he won in 83. And it tends to be left unexplained in as much as the story is wonderfully young, talented politician, wins a seat. And then the story goes on. But if you pause and think about it, he was, as you say, in his early 20s. He was, in fact, in the US until shortly before the 83 election. The constituency that he won wasn't renowned for its level of constituency organisation or previous local election success, I think it's fair to say. And he himself wasn't, for all of the many positives one can say about him, a brilliant constituency campaigner is, I think, a phrase probably nobody ever used about him. And yet, if you look at the win, it was a huge 18% vote share increase, as you say, the only SDP gain of that election. Just how did he manage to pull off such a remarkable win, being so young, so inexperienced, and out of the country until just before the election? Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure I can give you a good answer. I mean, it was completely against the run of the the tide for that election, which, of course, was the Thatcher landslide. Uh, I mean, the Liberal Party made a number of gains, but quite small. Uh, of course, the vast majority of the SDP's MPs, who were defectors mostly from the Labour Party, all lost their seats. They lost some of the by-election gains as well, just holding on to Roy Jenkins. So it was a real surprise. His biography, written by Greg Hurst, is very good, and I recommend it to people to read. But I'll, it I'll really... include a link in the show notes, as you say. It, it's a, a very good, sympathetic and critical biography in yep. one, isn't it? It's rare to get a biography that does both halves of yep. that telling of a story of, of somebody. Yes, absolutely. And the second edition was published after he died. So it's more of a kind of complete story. Um, it's a really good read. Yeah. But it doesn't, I mean, it treats the constituency campaign, the 83 campaign in about a page. So there are a few kind of, uh, few details that might help to explain it. The it was a new seat, Ross Cromarty and Sky. Been uh, the constituency boundaries were different. They're not hugely different from the previous one. There was some record of liberal strength in the constituency. The previous one, Ross and Cromarty, had been held by the Liberals from 1964 to 
1970. Politics wasn't terribly ideological in the sort of very large rural highland constituency. People tended to vote quite a lot on personalities. And Charles had a benefit and advantage there in that his grandfather, Donald Kennedy, was a well-known athlete. A lot of people knew him in the in the communities and the in the constituency. And his father was a well-known fiddle player. And indeed, in the the campaign, as I understand, was fought largely for just meetings, meetings in sort of village church halls, village halls, so on. There weren't any major centers of population in the constituency. So a lot of traveling around, speaking to fairly small uh, audiences, and they would send his father, Ian Kennedy, on ahead to entertain the meeting, the next meeting, with uh, fiddle I playing. So I hope Charles... you're not giving listeners any ideas for the next election campaign. With this Charles answer. would speak speaking to the previous meeting. Actually, I mean, I was in 87, I worked for Archie Kirkwood, who was MP for Roxburgh and Berwick and the Scottish Borders. And our constituency was a bit like that. We didn't have any fiddle players, sadly, but we did end up speaking to a lot of small meetings in villages. So I can sort of relate to how it was. So personality helped, I think. The sitting Conservative MP, Hamish Gray, wasn't very popular. He was Minister of State for Energy. And one thing that happened in the previous parliament was the closure of the aluminium smelter at, I think it was in the Gordon, which was a major centre of employment and sort of sort of related to energy. So not much going for him. But even so, against the general swing towards the Conservatives, it was quite a remarkable result. And I guess it illustrates how before uh, the Lib Dems has became really got serious about targeting seats, a lot of people in the party used to think that which seats the party won an election was a fe- essentially a matter of random chance, that you could try to have a good national campaign, but which seats were then won you just have all sorts of odd seats popping up one where in in a way that I guess Charles's victory very much epitomizes. Um, I mean, I, I guess he's probably the last MP, you know, to have gained a seat for our party without any sort of constituency type intensive campaigning in the way that we would now recognize. If you think about, say, some of the gains in Scotland in the 1987 uh, election, those were very much yeah, although maybe not the level of intensity one would always associate with a target seat campaign, say, in more urban parts of England, perhaps, they were nonetheless, in many ways, recognisably proto-target seat campaigns in a way that Charles is just almost seems like it's from a, the last the last win from a different era, which is perhaps a testament to his his huge political talent and charisma. Yes, I think that's a fair comment. I mean, I think it's his, his skills as a communicator and as, as coming over as a an authentic human being, mm. not another professional politician that really helped. And that was a kind of constant theme of his political career. He, I think you're right, there wasn't any great record of constituency activism. Indeed, the Liberal Party had come in fourth place in the previous election in 1979. So it's even more a remarkable, a remarkable result. And in fact, Greg Hurst in the biography suggests that actually this was possibly part of the problem with Charles in that um, he almost felt it kind of helped to sow some seeds of self-doubt in that he felt he'd almost had an easier run into parliament than many of the other candidates who'd fought uh, elections really intensively, but then nevertheless lost. For example, Ming Campbell, who'd been defeated in Northeast Fife on the second attempt in the same election. And he kind of almost felt that he wasn't, he didn't deserve to be there. It was a kind of something, just a fluke, really. And possibly that's true. Another theory is that actually the one of the things tended to come to him quite e- quite mm. easily. He was quite a lucky leader. Paddy Ashdown, I think, once told me that he thought one of the problems with Charles is that he never really had to fight for anything. I think you can point out a couple of things in his political career where he did fight for things kind of against the tide. But often it seems he just kind of fell into a position. He succeeded almost without trying very hard. And that perhaps led him to think he didn't need to work very hard. Interesting parallel, perhaps, with Nick Clegg, although I think Nick had a much higher work ethic than Charles. Although I think some of the criticisms of Charles are somewhat unfair. I think it's also true to say that probably Nick was, you know, a harder worker as a politician. Yeah, Charles. I think that's right. There is and, quite a and lot. Similarly, Nick, you know, well, for Nick, the key battle that he had to win were internal party selections. And I think you do see an impact of that in his approach to political campaigning with the public of believing, of putting less effort into things like organisation building, 
which is where there's a real, very clear parallel, you know, a very tempting analogy to draw with Charles's experience. You know, Charles as leader wasn't really focused on building the organisation. But also in Nick's case, I think it helps explain his view about politics as being much more to do with rational debate over detail than it is, because in a way an internal selection is not completely that by any means, but there is much more of that. You know, the, the, the hustings and the Q&A is much more about engaging with detail of substance. Than, yeah, I think that's a fair comment. I think that's absolutely a fair comment. I actually always thought one of the problems with Nick Clegg as a very clever person. Mm. He just thought if he could explain things to people exactly. in enough detail, they'd understand. Like tuition fees, yeah. obviously it was the right thing to yeah. do. He was convinced himself. He just had to explain it to people. Yeah. But actually, you know, a lot of things meant it didn't work like that. So, but coming back to Charles, I mean, and I think you've slightly touched on already why almost from the moment he was elected, people were talking about him as a future leader. Partly, I guess, because of his own talents, partly because of the complete party meltdown that happened following the next general election with the disasters of merger, relatively few Liberal or SDP MPs elected in 83 or 87, and then the huge strains of merger. But what really made him stand out as being one of the sort of front runners as a sort of thought of as a major figure in the party and potential future leader? I think, well, in the SDP, of course, there were only six MPs in 83 and then five in 87. So it's a pretty small pool. He was young. He was charismatic. I think you could say he worked pretty hard, actually, at being a good constituency MP and being a good spokesperson in those times. And he carried that over into the first few years of the Liberal Democrats. He was, he managed to reach audiences that most MPs don't. He ended up being appearing on programs like Wogan or Have I Got News For You? Mm -hmm. Indeed, later on a bit in the career, he uh, gained the nickname of Chat Show Charlie mm -hmm. from some people possibly slightly envious at his kind of wide coverage. And, and that was at a time where a politician appearing on something like Have I Got News For You was much more of a rarity. I mean, in a way, he was one of the pioneers who sort of almost normalised that. But that that's was absolutely a real true. Yeah. exception, wasn't it? And yes, he was absolutely. very funny. You know, I, I mean, yeah. it's... He and Boris Johnson were both, you know, very successful in the Have I Got News For You because they were both very funny and came over as uh, interesting human beings. He was interesting. He was an ordinary human being. You can kind of think of it. You can... You could envisage yourself having a drink with him in the pub and actually enjoying it. He was self-deprecating. He was humorous. He wasn't like a typical MP at all. And of course, he was, from the point of view of the Liberal Democrats, he was the only one of the five SDP MPs to back merger with the Liberal Party in 87, 88, though Bob McLennan, who opposed it, then went with his party when they decided to merge. So that put him in a very strong position as well. And he was, you know, still one of the youngest MPs, even after 88, when the two parties merged, he was, I don't know if he was the youngest or perhaps second and youngest so obviously he had potentially a long career in front of him and being young sdp and scottish i think were all things that meant very often when either within the party or externally people were looking for somebody to help make up a balanced group of people or a balance but you know it just he naturally was very often part of the answer of oh we should involve him yes i think that's a fair comment so he was still, you know, relatively inexperienced as a politician at the time of the initial post-merger leadership election in 1988, where Paddy Ashdown defeated Alan Beath. But when it came to the end of Paddy's time as leader, and Paddy announced in 1999 that he was going to stand down at the end of the European elections, I think Charles was seen as the front runner pretty much from the day Paddy announced he was standing down through to the conclusion of the election that, you know, he won and won by a, a, a reasonably comfortable margin. Um, what was it that had made him just seem like definitely he was the, the leader of the pack, as it were, and and what made him win the, the leadership election? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question, because actually, if you look at his record under Ashdown as leader from 90, from 88 through to 99, it's not a terribly successful one. He was elected as party president in 1990 and served two terms from 90 through to 94. And, you know, it was pretty good. Party presidents in those days, maybe it's the same nowadays, tend to choose either whether they act as kind of spokespeople for the party, an extra spokesperson, perhaps voice of the membership, or they engage themselves in internal party organisation. He was never worried about internal party organisation. I, I think it's fair to say Charles and I are, are diametrically opposite ends of the spectrum on, good on that contrast. score, aren't we? <laughs> it's a very good contrast. But he was, he was up to a point he was quite a good um, spokesperson. But I remember listening to him on a Radio 4 programme I think it was during the 
92 election, or possibly in the run-up to the 92 election, when the World at One decided to do three successive interviews, quite detailed, much longer than they usually did, with representatives of the three main political parties, and Charles was chosen to do the Lib Dem ones. And they asked him, they went into some detail on policy positions, what the party was going to fight on. And Charles was great at the headlines, the kind of first um, answer to the question, no problem there at all. But then they probed into more detail and they got him to explain it. And he fell apart remarkably quickly. He really couldn't. And you could tell he was waffling. And I thought, that's interesting. I hadn't thought, I thought that Charles was better than that. And it really didn't work terribly well. <clears throat> and I think that's one of the problems with him. He, because he was naturally a good communicator, he often came to rely on sort of natural talent and steadily did less and less work. I think it was a hard worker to start with, mm. but he became convinced that he could just do it without any sort of preparation. And I think sometimes that was shown up. And then uh, partly, I think, as a result of that, I think Ashdown saw that and basically kept him away from any major spokespersonships. And indeed, again, if you read Greg Hurst's biography, there's a note in it that says Ashdown himself was persuaded to take out quite a lot of negative comments um, when he published his diaries about Charles from the initial drafts mm -hmm. of the diaries, given that Charles was then leader by the time the diaries came out. I think Ashdown wasn't terribly impressed with him. And there's also a record of a chat with Tony Blair, with Blair saying, Charles Kennedy, all that natural talent, why is he so lazy? And there's a feeling that it was kind of going off the boil a bit. He wasn't really working hard enough at being a politician. Having said that, I think the reason why he was seen, that wasn't so obvious, I think, to mm. the party membership. And also, there wasn't really any competition on the kind of establishment side of the party. Um, whereas on the kind of anti-establishment side of the party, people who were increasingly sceptical of Paddy's uh, strategy of getting close to the Labour, there were kind of too many MPs competing for the for the potential leadership. And in the end, we had four um, candidates, Simon Hughes, uh, Jackie Ballard, David Rendell and Malcolm Bruce, um, all sort of going for their kind of anti-establishment vote, whereas Charles was very clearly the kind of the candidate the party establishment would back. And I think almost at at that stage, I think it almost would have been more difficult for him not to stand as leader. The kind of line of least resistance was to him to go away and stand as leader. And I think that was, again, a problem that we saw during his leadership later. He was never terribly clear about why he wanted to be leader. But I think the main reason why he was elected is what I would say is my iron law of Liberal Democrat leadership elections. The party always votes for the candidate who is most unlike the previous leader. So you had Paddy Ashdown, hyperactive, driven, always had a strategy, always had a plan, always had to try and lead the party in a, some kind of direction. And increasingly, after 97, trying to lead it in a direction it didn't want to go to, of kind of cozying up to Labour. Charles was just the opposite of that completely laid back, relaxed, much more collegiate, much less likely to try and push the party somewhere it didn't want to go. And that's why he won. And I guess Malcolm Bruce of those other candidates is the one who could perhaps have best tried to pull off the sort of splintering that establishment vote in terms of his, you know, he had a very impressive run as the sort of chief shadow economic spokesperson helped partly by the skill of David Laws as you know, one of one of the staff working uh, working to support him at the time, if I remember correctly. But as I recall, Malcolm's leadership campaign was organised on a very small and late scale, I think is probably fair to say. I assume that he had changed his mind relatively late in the day about standing, but, I, but you know, he was up against a relatively weak field in that sense as well, wasn't he? And it was just almost natural that the party's clearly most naturally talented communicator would therefore stand for leader it's you know you you almost do it by default without necessarily as you say him having to have a really good reason to do it yes i think that's right i mean i don't know what malcolm's kind of unique selling proposition was really on the one hand you had charles as the kind of leader of the establishment well established within the party popular with the party membership well known outside the party and obviously strong candidate on the other hand you had simon hughes kind of darling of the radical activists also very well known within the party, liked by many, probably distrusted by the establishment, if I can say, seen as a bit dangerous and potentially erratic. And kind of what was the point of anybody else standing, really? I think those those were the obvious two candidates. Yeah. So as it as it turned out, Charles won the election fairly comfortably. 
Uh, he becomes leader. And I, I guess in terms of his time as leader, it falls into probably, well, two or three phases, doesn't it? You've got from becoming leader in 99 through to his first general election as leader in 2001. You've then got the 01 to 05 parliament and then the, the final denouement the last few months when he resigns under extreme pressure. One could maybe say he was ousted rather than resigned. Let's let's look at that first phase first, the 99 to 2001, because I think both at the time and in hindsight, that's seen as a pretty successful time as leader, that a lot of the expectations outside the party were that after the party's huge gain in seats in 97, with a, against a Tory government and then now being a Labour government was that the Lib Dems might well fall back in terms of seat numbers and so on. But actually in the 2001 election, the party's vote share went up and indeed the seat tally went up. Not hugely, there were six new MPs elected, if I remember correctly, a couple of previously elected MPs who didn't get back in, but the party you know, grew slightly in terms of parliamentary numbers as well as vote share. And I think probably Charles deserves a large share of the credit for that because... It was the combination of the key seat campaigning plus a successful national campaign that very much relied on his media skills, wasn't it? Yes, I think absolutely. I think it was successful. As you say, kind of the, the conventional wisdom was that Liberal parties, Liberal Democrats would lose votes and seats under a Labour government. And that completely changed changed that round. He gained, the party gained votes and seats in 2001. I think he got a couple of things absolutely right, I think. As I said, he was the kind of polar opposite of Ashdown. He, he was, rather than trying to get closer to the Labour Party, you know, with him, an increasingly increasing number of actions of the Labour government were things that the party disagreed with, micromanagement of public services, failing to invest in public services, actually, in the first two years, uh, first uh, four years. And so Charles edged the party away from the relationship. But he did it quite sensibly, rather than just ending the formal structure, the Joint Cabinet Committee that Ashdown and Blair had established, he basically allowed it to do a bit more work, particularly on European policy, but then ended up simply telling Tony Blair he didn't want to go on with it after the 01 election. So rather than have a sort of a hard break, which perhaps some of the other leadership contenders might have led to, and poisoning relations with the uh, Labour Party, um, he let it just wither on the vine. Uh, and that was important, I think, in 2001, when there was still quite a lot of Labour, Liberal Democrat tactical voting, the, the hatred of the Tories was still quite strong, and there was still some cooperation in the election campaign. I think you can you can see a good example of Charles's kind of more laid back, more understanding the party type of approach was over the issue in Wales, where after the Welsh Assembly elections in 1999, Labour had failed to win the majority. So this was the first elections, wasn't it, of the, the new assemblies in Scotland and Wales. So Labour had initially formed a minority government, but faced defeat in the vote of no confidence in February 2000. And Charles came in for heavy lobbying in favour of a deal with the Liberal members of the Assembly from both Tony Blair and Paddy Ashdown. But he refused to intervene. He said it's up to the Lib Welsh Liberal Democrats. And he said to Blair, you don't understand. It's not my decision. It's their decision. It's devolved. So absolutely the right position in for internal party management, absolutely right in terms of understanding of the politics of devolution and displaying independence from Labour. All those things got absolutely right. And in the end, in fact, the, the Welsh leader was defeated. The Labour, I can't remember what they called it, first minister, is it? In mm. Wales, first secretary, was defeated. And the new one ended up forming a coalition with the Welsh Liberal Democrats and actually rather successful anyway. Second good example of good judgment was during the Romsey by-election in May 2000. The Tory MP died in a house fire. It was one of the Conservatives' 50 safest seats. Didn't look like a good prospect for Liberal Democrats, but Kennedy decided to fight it seriously and took him on and attacked, specifically attacked the Conservative leaders, William Haig's saloon bar language and gutter politics on immigration and asylum. Haig was trying to take the Tories mm. considerably to the right in those days. And in the end, the Liberal Democrats won Romsey on the 18% swing from the Conservatives. A hugely unexpected result and helped to actually undermine Haig's position as Tory leader. I, I do wonder, though, how much either of those two points about the Romsey by-election uh, are actually really reflect to Charles's credit in that, I think, firstly, Chris Renard would have fought that by-election very intensively anyway. 
and indeed under Pandy Ashdown, when Pandy didn't want to fight initially the Eastbourne by-election intensively, Renard got his own way, rightly so, given given how events transpired. So although Charles gets some credit for that, I think in practice, the party would have the party's campaign machine would have gone all out anyway. And the point about him having well. I, I guess, in fairness, it may have been very canny politics because the point about, you know, if, if a party leader makes a speech on an issue in a by-election campaign, it is such a tiny proportion of what most voters in that seat hear about that party and their candidate during the, the by-election campaign. And again, I think if you look at the literature in that by-election, you know, that Charles's speech certainly played well, I think, with members and got a good burst of, you know, favourable media coverage. But I I would very much doubt whether most voters really were moved by it at all if they even noticed it. If you look at if you look at the by election through the medium of what landed in people's litter boxes. Well, you might be right, but it is very unusual for one opposition party to take a, a mm. seat off another opposition party in the by election. That hardly ever happens. And I mean, Kennedy repeated the attacks on Hague and the conservative position on immigration in the 01 election and used the slogan, I jump on injustice, not bandwagons. So I think, you know, it was it was a clear attempt to mark out a very different position from the conservatives. And I think uh, anyway, whether we would have won it anyway in this slightly different mm. campaign is different. I mean, I think he was doing the right things mm. from the party point of view. And, and there and is in, a degree to which, you know, good leaders are lucky. And, you know, even yeah. if even if some of that stuff would have happened anyway, you know, one has to one has to give a leader a bit of credit for at least allowing luck to to prosper. That's true. <laughs> also, I think the other thing is nobody it was pretty clear that Labour were going to win the two thousand and one election. In fact, it was totally clear right from the beginning. So it wasn't like we had um, much scrutiny uh, of the Liberal Democrat position. He didn't he wasn't forced into that kind of position I described in nineteen ninety two of having to defend Lib Dem policies in lots of detail. Um and he came over pretty well. Yeah. He was a good communicator communicator, as I said an authentic human being. So I think all those things helped uh, understand, explain the reasons why we did actually well, much better than people expected in the 01 election. Now your praise of Charles is about to dry up, I suspect, but maybe slightly surprisingly so, because if you think about what happens between 2001 and 2005, is that the 2005 general election, Lib Dem vote share goes up, Lib Dem MP numbers go up, and we can look but look back enviously <laughs> from successive year successive general election results to that peak of 2005 in many ways 2005 has been the peak for the liberal democrats and prior to that liberals well the alliance and then prior to that liberals all the way back to you know one of the 1920s general elections so in many ways charles in 2005 led led us to our best ever general election results. So you are presumably now going to praise his leadership during that 2001 to 5 parliament. So a lot of things went right, certainly, and there's no question about that. Um, there's a but coming, listener, there's a but. Uh, so remember that the the political agenda changed completely, basically, in 11th September 2001. So we had the attack on the Twin Towers, and then subsequently the decision of the Labour government to join the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. And we had, I think then, the best chance for a generation in we held a policy position mm. in opposition to the war, which was both unique among the three main parties and popular in the country. These things don't happen very often. And uh, an and issue think, that was a major headline issue in the country as well. Uh, totally salient. Absolutely right. So I think the question is whether actually we should have achieved more in the 2005 election than we did. And there certainly was a feeling at the time that we could have done. But let's go back and remind ourselves what happened. The party was always sceptical of the war. I mean, we supported the invasion of Afghanistan. That was, we thought that was justified. But the as it became clear that the US was planning to invade Iraq, we displayed a steadily different position from the others. We were not anti-war in all circumstances. Mm -hmm. Interesting, there's been a debate on Twitter over a few weeks in December on the History Group Twitter feed about whether any other leader would have opposed the war in Iraq. Ashdown probably wouldn't have done. And in fact, Ashdown is on record as saying he supported the war in Iraq. And if he had still been leader, he would have 
said that and then his time as leader would have been over because he recognised it wasn't a view held by the majority of the party. Somebody was arguing that Min Campbell would also have um, supported the war in Iraq. I think that's completely wrong. The party conference, successive party conferences made clear what our position was, that we would participate in military action only as a last resort and under a clear UN mandate and only after a debate and vote in Parliament. And of course, there was never that second UN resolution, which meant the party was united. There was some hesitation about whether Charles or any other Lib Dem spokesman should join the big anti-war march in February 2003. And in the end, so Ming was Ming was foreign affairs spokesman at the time, but he was quite sceptical of this because it was organised by kind of far left outfits, stop what became, I think, the Stop the War Coalition mm-hmm. and radical Muslim groups as well. But it achieved, you know, it attracted huge amount of public support. Was it? I can't remember how many million people were supposed to take part in the mm-hmm. march. Um, yes, I, I think in it's it's often forgotten that the original slogan for that anti-Iraq war march levered in bashing Israel over Palestine, which was, you know, just the whole criticism of what the US government in particular was up to was it was using a wafer thin excuse of something that happened somewhere else that the Iraqi government was was not involved in at all to try to excuse taking action in, in part in Iraq. And yet that was exactly what the organisers of the protest were doing. And I, I think because the march attracted such huge public support and therefore, in a sense, outgrew the original organisers, I think it's easy to forget now that it it, it, it it looked much more questionable in the early stages of that march's organisation, whether it was would, would be the right thing to take part in or not. And I think it's, although, you know, those who are arguing that Charles should take part, I think were definitely right to argue that. I think it was a more finely balanced argument for a while now than it for a while than it now looks in hindsight. Yeah, I think that's right, actually. And it's, it's one thing that's characteristic of Charles that we haven't mentioned. He also he generally disliked confrontation mm. and therefore tended to delay taking a decision if he could possibly. I think when he was forced into taking a decision and actually, I think, taking part in the march when he was basically almost kind of bullied into it, perhaps by at a lunch of Guardian journalists who were criticised him over prevarication. When he was forced to take a decision, he generally made the right one. He had good judgment. And I think he had a better feeling for party and public opinion sometimes than Paddy. But when he didn't have to take a decision, he often just didn't do anything. And I think that was the problem. But in 2003, he didn't, in the end, decide to take part in the march. And got a lot of coverage. The final vote in Parliament was in March 2003, and we were the only major party not to split over the over the invasion of Iraq. And of course, the war itself was quite short, but then the aftermath was very long drawn out, and everything started to go wrong about the, the lack of any evidence of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, the failures to build a successful regime in Iraq, and generally everything started to turn against the Labour government and seriously undermine Tony Blair's own position, clearly. And again, an example of, I think, good judgment, Charles was invited to participate into the inquiry into the failures of intelligence that led up to the decision to go to war, the Butler inquiry, on the grounds that it was to exclude the political decisions taken on the basis of the intelligence. And that was a good move, I think, you know, obviously the temptation was you're an opposition party leader, you're invited to join this inquiry into whether the prime minister made the right decisions. Big temptation to join Mm. it, I think. And he decided not to. And I think it was quite right to do so. Generally, it was regarded as unlikely to be particularly critical of the prime minister. Though, in fact, in the end, it was. But that was a bit of a surprise. (laughs) I I think Uh, the other thing that's common about those occasions where he made the right call and showed good political judgment is those were all occasions where a decision was needing to be taken and therefore in a sense he was forced to albeit as you say maybe sometimes slowly but he was forced to decide you know think about yes no and decide I think what is notable if you look think about the party's strategy in that parliament where the a party strategy is something that you have to proactively decide to think about and do something about, as opposed to something where a decision is forced on you and you can decide how to react, is I think it was really muddled because on the one hand, the party was presenting itself essentially as being more left-wing straight radical, you can argue over what the right term is, progressive, radical, left-wing, whatever, than the Labour Party, 
though, on things like welfare spending being very critical of some of the welfare cuts and freezes that the Labour government was introducing. So in that one sense, carving out an approach, you know, on the sort of radical side of Labour, but on the other hand, positioning itself as being the effective opposition and therefore a better opposition party than the Conservatives to the Labour government. And in as much as there were strategy plans that were presented at things like training weekends for target seat candidates, it was step one, be the effective opposition. Step two, overtake the Tories. Charles Kennedy becomes leader of the opposition. Step three, win a general election, become prime minister. And you sort of think, well, how how was step two meant to really work? Because if you're replacing the Tories, but with a political positioning that isn't to the right of Labour, where are those people who voted Tory going to end up going? It just, it never quite was clear how that was really meant to work. And in that sense, we'll obviously come on to what happened in the 2005 election in a moment. But I think Charles was remarkably lucky that he and the party didn't do better in 2005. Because for all of the many mistakes that Nick Clegg and colleagues made in 2010 to 15, I mean, imagine if 2005 had ended up being a hung parliament with the Labour Party led by Tony Blair fresh out of the Iraq war, the Conservative Party led by Michael Howard fresh out of a general election campaign with a very strongly anti-immigrant. What on earth would the Liberal Democrats have done in a hung parliament like that? And I think the failure to have a strategic plan would have was, was sort of glossed over by the fact that the Liberal Democrats didn't do better in 2005. But I just, I mean, how would the, a 2005 hung parliament have ended in any way better than the 2010 to 15 parliament turned out? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And I think this, this brings us to the key question of whether Charles was a good leader or not. And I think his main failing, so, I mean, the, the debate is between those who think he was a great leader, basically brought down by drink, which became evident, more and more evident, or well, the problems it caused became more and more obvious from about 2002, three onwards, or whether actually he was never that great a leader, drunk or sober, basically. And I think I would put myself firmly in the latter camp. I began to see Charles's leadership much more at close quarters from about the end of 2003 when I was elected as chair of the conference committee. And there was a, I was then co-opted onto the policy committee, which Charles had decided to lead like Paddy Ashton, had, sorry, to chair like Paddy Ashton did, but never gave it any clear direction or expressed any view really on anything completely unlike Paddy. And there was also something called, a, I can't remember what it exactly it was called. It was like a chief officers group, basically chairs of committees, senior staff who used to meet quite regularly so i saw charles at much more close close noted close quarters of course, yeah. uh, and i began to realize what i think people other people have been saying for some time it's interesting that in again going from greg Hurst's biography the in 1999 during the leadership contest the west highland free press which is one of Charles's local constituency newspapers, had commented that people in London were beginning to ask what they had been asking for 15 years. What exactly did Charles Kennedy stand for? Charles published a book in 2000 called The Future of Politics. Again, I think following the kind of Ashdown model of publishing several books in Paddy's case. And it was supposed to, as Charles wrote in the foreword to the book, it was designed to answer the question, what makes this Kennedy fellow tick? Why is he a liberal Democrat? You can read it now and you don't get any clear answer. Again, as Greg Hurst put it, it revealed a startling lack of original thinking on policy or a strand of political thought that was identifiably his own. In fact, I wrote part of it, though I didn't even realise I was writing part of it because Richard Grayson, who was his speechwriter and had put it put the book together for him, basically asked me to write a short piece on environmental policy. He didn't actually tell me what it was for, but I recognised the wording when I read the book. And this became, <clears throat> I think the, the lack of an agenda became more and more obvious. I think he was lucky, actually, in that the Iraq war happened mm. because that gave him an agenda, a very clear agenda, and one that reaped considerable political success in terms of local election results from 2003 onwards and by-elections and so on. So that was good. I think it's quite possible that without the Iraq war, or perhaps if there had been a second UN resolution and we would have ended up not opposing the war, that's a subject for another discussion. It would have been obvious that he didn't really know what he was standing for. I think it all helps to explain why 
the Orange Book, Reclaiming Liberalism, appeared in 2000, August 2004, which re- your listeners might remember, edited by David Laws and Paul Marshall, can be seen as an attempt to give the party direction in the absence of any kind of leadership from Charles himself. And indeed, the the book, sort of the trailer for the book before its appearance in the run-up to the 2004 conference, The Guardian described it as a claim that Liberal Democrats are set to be shaken by a controversial call from the party's young Turks to adopt new, tough Liberal policies, which are pro-market and more Eurosceptic, and place new responsibilities on persistent offenders. And the kind of maybe reinforce the kind of debate that was going on, the kind of the standard debate we have in the party all the time between social liberals and economic liberals, between kind of more market oriented people and more interventionist oriented. But there was no clear leadership coming from, no clear direction coming from Charles at the time. So these kind of debates almost kind of began to spin out of control and they started being identified with all sorts of other divisions like between the parliamentary modernizers mm-hmm. trying to you know get away from the party's bureaucratic committee structure and the grassroots who were attracted to keeping our democratic committee and conference structure and everything people began to talk more and more about splits and about whether Charles was going to stand down as leader perhaps temporarily in the light of his problems with alcohol so you can see from pretty much 2003, 2004 onwards, particularly after the spring conference in 2004, when Charles was very obviously suffering. He missed, he had missed the budget statement in the House of Commons the week before his leadership speech to the spring conference in Southport. It's the first conference I had as uh, FCC chair. Actually, he was very clearly, his hands were shaking. You could see that when he was delivering a speech, he was sweating a lot, mm-hmm. though to be honest, the television lights were actually quite strong there. Um, and obviously something was wrong with him. And people began to wonder, you know, is something wrong with him? Is he going to stand down? In a world mostly before social media and with a moderately deferential me- <laughs> sort of media in terms of people's private lives, or maybe one should say a particular fear of libel law and the like, I think for most people in the party, and indeed more widely, the alcoholism was just not even thought of as being it. It, it was taken at sort of face value that he was okay. You know, he like everyone, he occasionally you fall ill, and he had bad bad luck of having been a bit ill before that conference and so on. I I, I recall being in the hall listening to that speech, for example, and people's reaction to the speech being, oh, well, he was clearly ill, but actually he did it quite okay. You know, it, it, there was, I think it was quite rarefied in limited circles in which alcoholism or possibly it being alcoholism was talked about, wasn't it? Yes, I think that's right. I mean, you know, his fondness for a drink was not a secret. Mm-hmm. And I remember him seeing pretty much the worst for wear at various glee clubs at conferences, but then many other people were pretty much the worst for wear at the same event. I mean, so always by definition, surprised. if you're at an event, <laughs> if you're not the worst for wear at an event like that, I mean, it is such a horrific event that you won't be there. You know, you, it, I don't agree it's horrific. Like to be worse for wear. <laughs> yeah, it, so it that's is, fine. I believe, very enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it became, I think it became more talked about after that famous Jeremy Paxman interview in, I think it was 2002, when Paxman interviewed him, I think, for Newsnight about generally his leadership. And one of the questions he asked was something along the lines of, does it worry you that every MP we've talked to in preparing for this interview has said, you're interviewing Charles Kennedy? I hope he's sober. Mm. And Paxman pressed him on whether he liked to drink it late at night, whether he drank whiskey to himself, which Charles was able to deny quite genuinely, because actually he wasn't a whiskey drinker. <laughs> By and large, he drank gin or wine, I think. And also because Paxman also went over the top and talked about his lack of, he wasn't married at the time, and kind of hinted that he might be a closet gay. Mm. And that caused a lot of outrage because, well, the whole thing together. So the kind of thing, actually, Paxman was getting at the right he was along the right lines on alcoholism. He wasn't along the right lines on criticizing or implicitly criticizing Charles for being gay and not being not admitting it. So that kind of passed over, but it helped to just form the sort of background that people began to look at Charles, I think, a bit more carefully and just note the number of events where he was obviously a bit the worse for wear, where the number of events that he was supposed to appear at a meeting or a local party meeting or a 
university meeting, whatever, and he ended up cancelling at short notice a number of times when he didn't appear in the House of Commons and began to think, actually, there is something a bit more serious here. Now, one thing we didn't know until uh, Greg Hurst's biography came out was that in 2003, Charles had actually organised a press conference to announce that he was an alcoholic and he was seeking professional help and he was going to stand down and hand over to Ming Campbell as deputy leader until the problem was resolved. And in fact, Ming was actually on the train down from Edinburgh to speak at the press conference when Charles changed his mind and cancelled the press conference. Fortunately, the reason for the conference had not been, the press conference had not been announced, so nobody was any the wiser. Ming got off the train at the next stop and just got on the train going back up to Edinburgh um, straight away. But nobody knew about that at the time. But after the spring conference in 2000, I think Chris Renard and a couple of others, I don't remember who it was, I think possibly the chief whip and somebody else confronted Charles and said, look, you are you an alcoholic? And Charles admitted it. And Charles promised to sort it out. Mm-hmm. And the trouble is then that Charles wasn't consistently suffering from alcoholism. But I think when he did, what happened was, particularly after the Paxman interview, his office became more and more used to kind of keeping him out of sight and lying to the press, basically. And that increased his sense of isolation from the parliamentary party. He didn't have many close friends in the parliamentary party. So he's beginning to lose support there. People were getting more and more aware of all the occasions when, as I said, he was the worst for wear or cancelled because they assumed he was the worst for wear. And that all helped to kind of kind of undermined his leadership, basically. And that's but, so the denouement with the notorious 2005 yeah. general election press conference and then the aftermath. But before we come on to that, I think there is also an area of more policy substance, which I think also fed into the problems for the party at the time, which was the Labour government had, by this time, hugely increased public spending on public services with limited results some you know in very direct initial improvements as the as the money taps got opened but then increasingly you know this was one of the you know the big debates in the labor party was about how much do you have to reform public services are we really seeing enough improvement for all the extra money and i think for the lib dems it's always a much more straightforward comfortable position to be in when you're in one, which is actually what we're in at the moment, speaking ahead of the most likely 2024 general election or general elections, or in the advance of 1997, of where public services have been massively starved of money, and therefore we simply need to argue for more investment in public services, when the money taps have been flowing, and the question is much more about should public services be reformed or not, that gets into much tougher territory because you have a lot of people, for example, who work in public services in the Liberal Democrats and don't instinctively therefore come at these issues from a point of view of wanting to bash public services or and beat them up. Uh, but on the other hand, if you've got lots of money going in and you're a party with a liberal belief in suspicion about big government and so on, maybe you should be pushing more for public services reform. And so that is off, you know, when... At that period of time, I think this is partly what the Orange Book came from, was a sense of, well, Charles has put together a shadow cabinet team that is basically somebody with an education background will be our education spokesperson, somebody with a health background will be our health spokesperson, somebody with an education, you know, and so on, that that's very much a sense of being the corporate voice of public services. And you know, was that the right approach? You know, would that be challenging enough? To, to, to further in, increase the quality of public service. And obviously a very lively debate one can have on all sorts of aspects of that. But what was notable with Charles was that he didn't have a particular direction on that. And therefore that I think added to that wider sense of frustration because there was a almost an intellectual vacuum at the heart of the party's approach that didn't matter in the run up to 97, did matter in the boom times. You know, one could say at the moment matters much, much less. Quite what the current party would come to as a conclusion on that doesn't really matter in the current circumstances, but it really did in those sort of mid that middle of the first decade of the century, didn't it? Yes, I think that's right. And I think if you look back at the 2005 manifesto, it was not a great document. It was full of things we were against, 
the war in Iraq, tuition fees, which the Labour government had introduced, breaking their own mm. manifesto promise, something that everybody always forgets, frustratingly. It was against the council tax. It was against lots of other things. But there wasn't any kind of strong message tying everything together and giving a positive agenda. And one of the few things that was a kind of a, a, a positive proposal was replacing the council tax with local income tax. And of course, Charles completely uh, messed that up at the launch of the manifesto in the 2005 election campaign because he was hungover and unprepared to be able to cope with the details, just couldn't answer the details of how it was going to work. But I think the underlying problem was that, again, there wasn't a clear message. And that, I think, became much more obvious in the 05 election than it had in 01 because the election was much tighter. Labour looked like they were going to win, but they weren't ahead so convincingly. It could have been perhaps a hung parliament. So there was more attention to the party, there was more attention to Charles. I remember actually, I said I was, as FCC chair, I was co-opted onto the FPC and I came in at this kind of tail end of an argument that had been going on, I think about trying to be a bit clearer about what the party stood for, what the positive case for being the Liberal Democrats were. And in the end, we added a section on the Liberal Democrat approach to the 2005 manifesto, or at least we insisted on adding it, the FPC did. And Chris Renard printed it in like six point type under the credits on page two. So nobody would have read it anyway. And maybe, you know, it didn't make any difference, even if it had been in much bigger time. But that argument was clearly going on. There was a lot of unhappiness, I think, at the time about there being any kind of positive agenda for the party. So at the and, same time, the party was doing points, quite well on the back of a negative agenda. And those 10 points of we oppose this thing, we propose the alternative. I mean, one could argue that in a way that was relatively positive because for every negative, there was a positive associated with it. But there were all sorts of, tortured culinary metaphors that were then used after yes. the 2005 election to say well those 10 things were the ingredients but we didn't have the recipe you know we didn't have a yeah. story that brought those 10 together um but as you say during the 2005 election there is this press conference where charles is hung over he completely stuffs up a question about local income tax it's explained away at the time as he had recently become a father and you know, therefore, for the very best of reasons, had not had that much sleep the night before. Actually, his ratings take a huge knock, but then recover very well during the election campaign. The party ends up <clears throat> at a you know peak of votes and seats. Although, as we both talked about, one could maybe say under those very favourable circumstances, perhaps that was more of a missed opportunity. And perhaps, thank goodness, the party didn't do slightly better in terms of what a hung parliament would have then turned out like. Uh, but I think for most of the public and members, it's still a case after 2005, well, the Lib Dems have made progress. The leader had one bad press conference, but so what? Most not aware of any problems with alcoholism and so on. But you then have this final stage where it takes, what, about six months, isn't it, between the, the election result and him uh, resigning under under pressure, uh, Eight months altogether. I think the party was not quite as mm. relaxed as you put it. And I think I remember the 2005 conference being quite an unhappy no, That's affair. true. You're right. I, I, I didn't pick my words brilliantly there because, in fact, I remember that both you and Richard Grayson, who were seen as being on the left of the party, as it were, were amongst those who were pretty critical of essentially saying, you know, the party had a missed opportunity. And I think Richard had this phrase that Charles had been a chairman rather than the chief executive, that that was his style as leader. Perhaps, I think, perhaps more of a chairman than a leader, he said, yeah. whereas those of us who were on the FPC and the experience as chairman tended to think, if only. So, yeah, I mean, it was, I think the party did do quite well, as he said, in 05, who gained seats. But the party's vote only went up by 1% over mm. the course of the campaign, which was less than in previous campaigns. And although we won seats from Labour, we lost overall net seats to the Conservatives. Mm. And there was this decapitation strategy aimed at sort of taking out leaders or major figures in the Conservative Party, like Theresa May, of course, who wasn't leader at the time. And it completely failed, with the exception possibly of Tim Collins, though he wasn't really a major. And, and the Conservative sort of key seat campaigning, grassroots campaigning, had pretty much caught up with the Lib Dems in 2005, that there was a lot of talk after 2005, whether we had lost our edge. And in fact, 2005 saw the, the really the first big step forward in the quality of the Tory direct, direct mail operation. As a little digression, it's also, I think, massively underrated 
as a, the importance of the election for changing the way that target seat campaigns work, because that was the first election in which a major party, the Tories in this case, really pushed the envelope on doing target mail, posted target mail in target seats that, that wasn't included in the constituency expense return. And they did it in a way that, you know, was legal, but was really, you know, they, they took the plunge of pushing pushing the boundaries first. And then you see Labour and the Lib Dems, you know, follow follow in their wake in, 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 in 2010. That's but if you want to understand why constituency target seat campaigns now actually feature the candidate relatively little, 2005 was probably the key, the key turning point. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Anyway, regardless of that, I think that the conference there was a clear feeling that the party had done well, but should have done better. I said, given the circumstances, the major issue was still the war in Iraq. We were the only party opposing it. The Conservatives were still not particularly popular. People still remembered their time in government up to 97. We made a few gains, but not that many. The vote only went up by 1% during the campaign. What was the, why shouldn't we have done better? So it was a bit of an unhappy conference. There were a couple of leadership defeats on relatively minor issues, but it kind of helped to helped to reinforce the situation that the leader didn't know really what he was doing. The parliamentary party was increasingly unhappy because they'd done a rather, I said this is part of Charles's dislike of confrontation. He was really bad at reshuffles. We had enough MPs at the time to have a shadow cabinet and then backbenchers. He dropped several veteran MPs in favour of MPs who'd just been elected over quite a long period. It was all a bit messy. People were feeling just generally grumpy and unhappy. One thing the FPC did at the time was set up a policy review called Meeting the Challenge. It's one of those kind of periodic exercises we do to look at whether the party's platform is really up and up to speed with um, current challenges facing the UK. Charles decided to chair it. I was vice chair, actually, and I remember the first meeting of the group in probably June or July in the House of Commons. We kind of sat around waiting for him for a bit, and then somebody said, Duncan, why don't you start chairing it? So we started off the meeting. After about half an hour, Charles came in sat down next to me and just the wave of alcohol that came off him was really marked. I'm sure other people in the room must have noticed it. And this was like some like two o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon. It, you know, it wasn't late at night or anything. And he basically didn't engage in that particularly. And then after the conference during the autumn, the cancelled appearances became more and more obvious. Mm. He was supposed to turn up to a university meeting, I think, where some of our new MPs were present and just cancelled it at the last moment. And just people began to be more and more unhappy about this. I don't think it was just alcoholism. As I said, it was a combination of that and the lack of agenda. And I remember during that period, Steve Webb asked Charles in a parliamentary party meeting, he just said, what motivates you, Charles? What gets you up in the morning? And Charles just couldn't give a clear answer at all. So I think it was a general feeling that, a growing feeling, I should say, that Charles just he may have been a great communicator in the past, uh, a kind of authentic human being, but he wasn't a good leader. He wasn't a potential prime minister, and the party was suffering because of all those problems. So there were two attempts uh, over the winter of uh, just before and after Christmas 2005 to persuade him to stand down, perhaps temporarily, so he could sort seek um, professional help for alcoholism or perhaps uh, permanently. The first one went wrong because news of it leaked out and Charles faced down his critics um, and uh, and basically dared them to bring him down, which they didn't at the time. But then, then the key event took place in January, early January 2006, when the ITN, I think it was, told his office that they were going to run a story about his drinking, which had always been denied publicly mm -hmm. until then. So they organized a press conference, just as they were planning to do in 2003. Charles revealed that he was an alcoholic. He had successfully sought professional help for alcoholism, and he thought the problems were behind him, which clearly was not true in retrospect. But he also said that he felt it only fair that party members should have a say in the matter. So he was calling a leadership election in which he would be a candidate. And the parliamentary party just was not prepared to put up with that. They kind of knew he, most of them, not not everyone, but the majority of them did not believe he was capable of giving an effective lead to the party. So the majority of them then came up with a statement, or I think about half of them, said they were not prepared to serve under him. So finally, he resigned the leadership two days later on 7th January 2006. And what was notable was how many of the MPs newly elected in 2005 were amongst those who signed up to that statement that 
and as you say I, i'm sure amongst them there will have been a range of views about to what extent it was about health and to what extent it was about leadership but just fundamentally saying and i think that had quite an impact on a lot of party members are sort of thinking at first actually of making members more angry but you know surely you should be grateful to charles who was leader in the election in which you got elected but then also it flipped around to being more understanding of well actually if you know, if if, if even, even if the new MPs who would expect to be grateful for him are saying that, you know, he's no longer up to it. Then yeah, that's right. Maybe they're right. And there have been kind of signs, straws in the wind of that. I remember they had the position of parliamentary party chair at the time, which Matthew Taylor had held and then decided Paul Holmes, who knew they'd been elected in 2005, decided to challenge him for that after the election. Matthew ended up trying to campaign on the basis that Ch Charles didn't support him, which was just a kind of bizarre position. And in the end, he lost anyway. So, I mean, that was a pretty serious sign that things were going wrong there. I think... It was, again, if you read Greg Hurst's biography, it's, <laughs> I keep on mentioning it, it is a very good, it has a very good detailed explanation of what went on over those few weeks before and after Christmas 2005. And it just shows how reluctant people were to do this and how they felt they were driven into it and had to have no other opportunity. Part of the reason why it was a bit long drawn out and messy was because some of the senior figures who perhaps could have gone to Charles and had a word with him felt themselves compromised because they would be candidates in mm. the in any leadership election to follow him. So Ming Campbell, as deputy leader, you could have said could have done that, but but he was going to be a candidate. So it looked like perhaps he was forcing him out for personal reasons. Same for the party president, who was Simon Hughes at mm. the time, who then again stood in the leadership election. So it was tricky. So it was left to actually a lot of the newer MPs led in the end by Ed Day and uh, Sarah Tether, who organised the letter to to say just too many MPs wouldn't mm. were not prepared to sign sign, them. and in fact more MPs were not prepared to serve under him than actually signed a letter. So it's pretty clear at the end that his position wasn't sustainable. Yeah. And I I was working at HQ at the time, amongst other things, looking after the mass emails for members, and hence looking at the responses that were coming back from members. And there was a very definite tipping point where members started off being annoyed at the media for scurrilous stories and annoyed at some Lib Dems for, for plotting against the leader, etc. to then flipping over to, oh my goodness, you know, he's clearly got to go. Um, yes. I think and I, right. I think looking back at it now, I, mean, I think in many ways people are probably more sympathetic now in that there is much wider understanding that alcoholism is a health problem and not a matter of human weakness and so i think in that respect well in two respects i think charles's reputation has improved in the you know in the intervening time one is quite rightly a much more sympathetic attitude towards alcoholism as a health issue and the second is we've not done as well as 2005 despite quite a few general elections now since on the other hand, I think if you look back to his time, certainly to me, one of the main lessons was that that surge in support off the back of opposition to the Iraq war neither translated to, into a growing local government base nor into a growing membership nor or other metrics that one might take of organisational success and that there was a real failure to turn political opportunity into organizational progress in a way that would then underpin winning seats in you know the way you necessarily have to target in the first part of the post election and 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 that is maybe a slightly niche sort of perspective to have on his time as leader but i think it's a really important one because it wraps up a crucial lesson which is that although it is easier to be organizationally successful and successful with targeting when you have a leader and a national party that is more popular than not they don't automatically follow and indeed one can make good progress on them even if you don't have those that that more favorable wider the classic example in terms of party membership being the party membership started growing again in the middle of the coalition period you know that for all that, that there is an extent to which if you want to be serious about organizational progress local government growth etc you have to target that specifically rather than thinking it will be just a natural outcome of having the right policies or the right message or having the right leader being on the right tv shows etc
I think that's true. I mean, in reality, you need a combination of things, don't you? I think actually, I mean, our local government strength did go up on the on the back of the Iraq War, and we were. Well, if you look at the if you look at the percentage of lib, of councillors who were Lib Dem, which is the sort of the better long term metric, because the number of the number of council councils and councillors in total has changed over years. There's a long term growth into the 1990s. You know, through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, with some ups and downs, Thorpe scandal and so on, long-term growth. But then it plateaus and declines before then the whole disaster of 2010 to 15. And then, you know, some quite notable recovery since then, particularly in 2019, but also, for example, in 2023. And you still think, well, if, you know, you've got that long-term growth and then a plateauing, surely the Iraq war of all should be the case where you that should be the occasion where you start off another period of growth. And actually that, you know, that, again, it's sort of the missed opportunity. That's there interesting. In many ways. Because we did come ahead of Labour in in the local elections in 2004 mm. on a notional vote of 29%. Mm. So perhaps there was a bit of a blip over that period, but perhaps not yeah, and, uh, well, as much and I think, as you would expect, maybe. And, and, it, and it wasn't sort of followed through in the sense that, you know, you, you, you definitely can look at places where we had, you know, impressive sort of local election results and so on. But then quite often they fell back when the Iraq war sort of impact yeah. came and went, as opposed to what, you know, for example, we had succeeded with the parliamentary seat targeting operation of really harnessing anti-conservative support in 97, but managing to hold on to it subsequently. And so yes, further in 2001 right. and for all of the missed opportunity of 2005, it was a relatively small number of seats gained in 97 that were lost in either 01 or 05 in total. Yeah. yeah. But I think, so I think we can, we could have a completely separate podcast probably mm. about what's the, what's the components of success mm. well, success for the party or success for a leader. I think, and I'd agree with what you say, but I think one thing that is important is that the party has to stand for something that's different from the other parties and just organizational strength and being opposed to the government isn't enough by itself. And I think that was the major weakness of Charles's leadership. He never had an agenda. When he was backed into a corner, when he had to make a choice, for example, in an election campaign or taking part in the war in Iraq, the anti-war march or the Butler inquiry, that kind of thing, he generally got it right. I think he made the, the come to the right conclusions. But between that, he kind of lapsed into inertia. And I think there's a kind of postscript there, He was, which demonstrates this yet again. He was one of the small number of MPs who didn't support the coalition at the meeting of the parliamentary party and the federal executive and two, when, after the 2010 election he was one of the seven I think who abstained or wasn't present he was present but he abstained and he, I remember he wrote an article in the Observer I think afterwards explaining why he didn't support it but he didn't have an alternative he didn't say yeah, exactly. I remember reading that Observer article at the time and thinking but I just don't get what your alternative is. Yeah, exactly. And I, yeah. and I think, I, you know, the, the passage of time since hasn't been generous to that article. It's not like that was a failure of me to see that here was an alternative plan. It was, in a sense, I guess his view was quite similar to Paddy's view, that they were both very uneasy about the implications. But in the end, I think it's fair to say Paddy took the view that actually there isn't another credible op you know, route this is really the only route that's on option. So we absolutely have to make the most of it. While Charles's was, I just wish there was another route. Yeah, and that's absolutely that, right. in a sense, is a bit of a failure of, of leadership. I think that there is also a distinction between being a leader when the Tories are in government and being a leader when Labour is in government. Because I think in the run-up to 1990, this question about, you know, what do the Lib Dems really stand for, etc., was a question often thrown at Paddy as well. But being an opposition party wanting to take seats off the Tory government is a very different and one might say perhaps easier frame within which to say actually no our priority is to take seats off the Tories whilst when you then have a Labour government having trying to hold on to those seats but then also saying how are you different from Labour and how do you segue that is perhaps a harder challenge in fairness to Charles but I think a challenge that he didn't, you know, for all sorts of reasons that we've touched on, he didn't really seem to want to try to resolve, let alone arguing about how good or not, you know, his, his answers were. It, it It's almost like it was a question that he wasn't, wasn't even really that interested in, in asking. 
and I, I and I and I make that distinction because I think that distinction is obviously quite relevant for drawing any conclusions for sort of the the future of the Lib Dems is that I think the challenges that Charles faced are ones that in some ways are not so relevant for the next election because we currently have a Tory government, but will become much more relevant if there is a Labour Prime Minister after the next election and its election at which we won a batch of seats off the Tories. And therefore, I think those lessons, which I would draw slightly differently from you, but more in, in terms of a temporal one, that they're ones for future Parliament, as it were. So... I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is easier under a Tory government since us and Labour are both anti-Tory parties by and large. But we're also an anti-Labour party. So, and it, it, But it's more difficult because they are more likely to do the things that we like. I agree it is a more difficult challenge, but I think it's not irrelevant under Tory government either. And also people's views of parties take quite a long time to change. So I think you just can't expect to change your position or change your message kind of every parliament and expect people to to catch up with them. I think it's the kind of problem that Nick Clegg came up with, thinking we could just change our position on tuition fees. And yeah, and I, and I think why. that's where the, 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 you really see the quality of strategic thinking by a party leader when you're coming towards the tail end of a government is are you arguing for things which it's credible could be the core part of what you're arguing for under that very different political environment of a different party. And there's always Absolutely. a thing about, and actually Charles made this point really well, and this must have been about 2005, 2006 that he made this point, that the issues that dominated the 01 to 05 parliament were almost completely absent from the 2001 general election campaign. And so his point in a way was actually for all the people like to say politics is about policies, not personalities, actually the policies you're debating at an election may turn out to be surprisingly irrelevant to what happens in the next few years. And therefore thinking about personalities or at least principles and general political direction is maybe a wiser thing to do than to really worry over the details of which policy do you more or less agree with from different parties, given how often you have that different environment. But I think coming back back to your point, the the thing that, for example, uh, um, you can see at the moment with, say, the Liberal Democrat focus on sewage and getting you know water utility companies to get their act together, that is something that is very easy to see transferring from working as a something to bash a Tory government with to something to bash a Labour government with. I think one of Charles's problems, which I guess he inherited from Paddy, to be fair, perhaps, uh, was the if you're arguing for lots more spending on public services, when you then have a Labour government that does do a lot more spending on public services, you, you have to change, in a sense, what you're saying to have to have anything to say about, well, what, what are we now doing on public services? And as you say, that's hard, a harder change to make because it's hard to get enough public attention to pull off, you know, a different message. But also intellectually, we never, the party never really came up with that answer. There were things like the Orange Book and so on, that attempts to come up with that, but there was never really a settled outcome to that debate, was there? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think I agree with you. The details of policies don't necessarily matter so much. They matter when they illustrate a sort of underlying narrative that people can associate with your party. And we've always struggled to achieve that. And my um, favourite example of that is Labour's opposition to the Tory plan to have a free vote on fox hunting in the 2017 election. If you look at things like the uh, Deborah Mattinson, before she went back to working for the Labour Party, the focus groups that she ran in that election, that was one of the things that act real voters most noticed about that election campaign. And that's not because fox hunting was right at the top of lots of people's you know, worry list, but it was hugely symbolic that if you say the Tories quite like fox hunting, just all of the mental, emotional images that brings to mind as to who you think of as being a Tory and as being pro fox hunting, you know, it worked really well as a totemic example of a much wider ideological message about about you know how Labour was trying to portray accurately, I would say, the Tory yeah. party. Yes, I think that's right. But we're kind of drifting into a slightly mm. different debate. So coming back to Charles, mm. I think the interesting thing is, I still really don't know what motivated him, what he really cared about. I think there was only one issue you can clearly identify that did motivate him, which was Europe. 
And that was part of the reason he switched from the Labour Party, which he joined at university or possibly at school, I think, to the SDP when the SDP was formed in 1981. And it was the only event, uh, the only issue I've ever heard him be passionate about. And particularly, I remember a debate I chaired actually in, I can't remember, it's either the 2013 or 2014 conference, one of the ones we had in Glasgow. And we had a debate on an EU policy paper, um, European policy paper, and it was a completely boring debate because everybody was on the same side. Um, and Charles gave far and away the best speech, and it was passionate and inspired and fast and punchy and all the kind of things actually he didn't usually speak like that he was much usually much more kind of a bit more sort of laid back and more sort of passive but it was a great speech he went well over the red light and I remember my aide Sal Brinton kind of nudging me to say you've got to stop him I thought I'm not going to stop him a nobody opposes this paper anyway so it's not going to make a difference to the vote and b it's a great speech and we might as well have something good out of this debate and it's really good speech but you know he wasn't like that very often and it's just it it's just a kind of tragedy thinking if only he could have been like that more consistently about a wider range of issues when he was leader i think he could have been a really great leader and i don't think in the end it was alcohol that brought him down i think possibly his alcoholism was a symptom of the problem not a cause i think i think subconsciously or maybe consciously he knew he wasn't a great leader and one of the reasons he well the strains of leadership as a whole were were pretty massive, and I think one of the reasons he drank was to was to try and cope with that. But it was lack of an agenda, lack of a message, lack of a narrative for the party that really means you can't rate him as one of the best of the party's leaders, even though the electoral record was actually pretty impressive. I think that, as you say, he sort of became leader in many ways because that's what people expected: talented, charismatic, youthful politicians to want to do and you you see a little bit I mean it's it's a real you know minor low-key small stage comparison but you see this I see this particularly over the years with some people who have sometimes ended up chair of a committee in the Liberal Democrats that there's a real difference between people who become a chair of a committee because there's something they want to do with that role and something they're passionate about and those who become chair of a committee because they've been the competent person who's been on that committee for 73 years. And so they're the obvious, you know, the obvious sort of choice, as it were. And the people who become the chair because they're the obvious choice often struggle, I think, to then do a good job in anything other than a very reactive way, because why are they actually doing it? On the other hand, of course, the people who've got a real passion as to what they want to get out of it, a bit like Paddy, can then run into problems of if they want to, what they really want to do is not what actually everyone else wants to do. And, in, you know, you see that. So you can, the listeners who are uh, Lib Dem committee members themselves, you can have fun classifying chairs of committees as to whether they are Paddy or Charles type characters in that respect. Totally. I think it probably leads us to the conclusion there is never any ideal person. We just have to go for the best option available. And or whatever is seems preferable at one leadership election, almost it's almost, as you said earlier, an iron law of politics that next time round people will suddenly think that the opposite is extremely attractive. Completely. On that note, we really should wrap up. We've done a, a probably the longest podcast. Uh, in this podcast history but absolutely Charles is such a fascinating character and there are so many facets that we've not really got into that is well worth the time that we spent on that uh, I will include links in the show notes to things like the first biography uh, that Duncan has mentioned and also if I can find the clip the BBC did a TV uh, documentary about new MPs elected the 83 election, which used to be on YouTube. So I will try to include a link to that because it includes a clip with Charles Kennedy and a few other quite youthful looking people who were still around in the party in the ba- in the background of some shots as well. Yeah. And BBC Scotland, I think, did quite a good biography of his mm-hmm. whole career just a few years ago, which I helped a little bit with, yeah. which is well worth finding the link to as well. He was, I mean, in many ways, he was he was a remarkable man. And he had many talents. It's just a tragedy that they weren't quite the right talents for the latter stages of his leadership. And on that note, let's wrap up then. And thank you hugely for your time and expertise, Duncan. Thank you to everyone for listening. With the way that Elon Musk is taking Twitter, this podcast is no longer on Twitter, but you can still find, at least for the moment, myself on there. 
at Mark Pack and Duncan at Duncan Brack. Do look out in the show notes for the follow up links that we've talked about. And if you like listening, please do tell others about this podcast and give it a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Mm-hmm.